The WHO has said that the best way to tackle this virus is to test, test, test. This is a call to action that pioneering biochemist Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues at UC Berkeley are working on now, as they aim to use their biology labs to test up to 2,000 samples per day. Baudna, co-founder of the gene editing tool CRISPR, is using that technology to try to fight COVID-19, as she explains to our Walter Isaacson now. And full disclosure, of course, Walter is currently writing a book on Baudna and her work with CRISPR. Dr. Jennifer Doudna, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. In early March, when you watched the spread of the coronavirus, you suddenly decided it was time for scientists to kick into action. So you took your Berkeley lab and some of the surrounding labs in uh, the San Francisco area and you mobilized them. Tell me what you did and why. We held a meeting to discuss how the scientists at UC Berkeley and our surrounding institutions could get together and address this uh, terrible pandemic. And then one thing that emerged from that meeting was that we should find a way to use our resources and our knowledge to test for the virus. Many of us agreed that one of the most, th most important things to be done right now to address the disease is to understand who's infected and how to keep others safe. And if you decide you're going to test, you do a regular test, but you have to get it approved, right, by the CDC. And once you've done that, what can you do, what, 500, 1,000 tests per day? So it's important to understand we're, we're academic scientists. We don't do clinical testing. To do clinical tests with patient samples requires regulatory approval from multiple agencies. So we've been uh, on a very fast track to learn, first of all, what kind of regula regulation do we need to comply with? How do we ensure compliance? And how do we get our, our, uh, our scientists trained to work safely under these conditions and do it very fast? So we've been fortunate that the state of California under its emergency declaration has made it easier to get approval. The Food and Drug Administration at the federal level has also been very cooperative in, in helping us to do this. And as a result, we are uh, really getting very close to being able to do a high throughput test for patient samples at uh, UC Berkeley. Many other universities' labs are being shut down, like with the rest of the university. Uh, do you think it would be a good idea for universities around the country to get permission to keep their biology labs open and shift them over to this thing of testing so every community could have a high throughput testing center? Well, I would, I would uh, first say that, you know, we're inspired by the University of Washington. Many people may, may be aware that their uh, 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 folks there, scientists, have been testing patient samples for weeks, and they've played a big role, actually, in helping to stem the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus up in the, the Seattle and, and larger area in Washington state. So we're inspired by this. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that people be working safely at this time. So we're very um, cognizant of having to use uh, low density laboratory conditions, making sure that our, uh, our scientists are appropriately protected physically from any potential for infection. But yes, I mean, I think beyond that, you know, if, if those conditions can be met, then I think uh, having scientists uh, working at this time and contributing their expertise to fight this pandemic is, is very valuable. You've said SARS-CoV-2. Is that the same as uh, the COVID-19 and the coronavirus we've been talking about? Uh, yeah, so let, let's, let's do a little terminology check. So I've had to learn this myself. So SARS-CoV-2 refers to the actual virus that is causing the current pandemic. Coronaviruses are the family of viruses. That's the family of viruses that uh, SARS-CoV-2 belongs to. And COVID-19 is the terminology for the disease that this uh, virus causes. You'll be doing the type of tests we've been doing for the past couple of months which is just a test for the presence of the virus. I've noticed that now in Britain and other places, they're starting to do antibody tests. Can you explain the difference? Right, so the test that we're doing at Berkeley is a test that looks at the virus RNA. It's the genetic material that allows the virus to replicate in, uh, upon infection. So we're using a test called the polymerase chain reaction that's approved by the World Health Organization and the CDC. It's a, a standard test. 
And importantly, it's able to detect the presence of the virus very soon after infection. So the difference between that type of a test and what you're asking about, a ser what we call a serological test that looks for antibodies to the virus, is that typically when someone gets exposed to the virus and their body makes antibodies, it takes a while for that to happen. So it's, a, it's really a, a test that looks after the fact. Has someone been infected by the virus? Also very useful to know, obviously, uh, and to figure out who has immunity uh, to the virus. But one of the challenges right now with those types of tests, as I've been learning, is that uh, the, the uh, testing materials are not accurate enough to ensure detection of just the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Right now, there's a lot of cross-reactivity with other types of viruses. And of course, many, many virologists and scientists are working on this problem, and they'll probably sort it out. But I think that's one of the challenges with those tests right now. It's taking four to six days to get the results of some of these tests. Would you be able to do it like in a few hours or a day? Yes, so that's, that's a primary goal of our lab at Berkeley and the Innovative Genomics Institute is to be fast. So we have brought in high throughput robotic equipment. We've got uh, companies helping us with data management and we hope to be able to do uh, one to 2,000 samples a day when, we get, when we're rolling. As you know, I'm writing a book about you and the discovery of CRISPR, which is the gene editing technology. And CRISPR, that technology, is based on a trick that bacteria figured out over the course of three billion years of how to fight viruses. Can you explain how CRISPR does that for bacteria? Sure, so CRISPR is a, an adaptive immune system. It allow, allows bacteria to detect viruses and protect themselves from future infection. And it's a system that uh, you know, a handful of scientists were studying. And, uh, and then a few years ago, it was recognized that you know, this system, which operates as an immune system, that we could actually harness it as a technology for something quite different, which is genome editing. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's a, it, I've been reflecting on this during this pandemic. It's a fascinating parallel that uh, bacteria have been dealing with viruses forever. They've had to come up with creative ways to fight them. And now here we are, humans, in a, in a pandemic facing uh, this, this challenge. And um, so we, we often think about, you know, how can, can CRISPR potentially impact this pandemic in ways that will be beneficial to humans? Can CRISPR be used as a detection tool to help us detect the virus in ourselves? So this is a really interesting use of CRISPR enzymes that takes advantage of something that my lab discovered about how they work, which is that in some cases, the enzymes are able to interact with a piece of nucleic acid, which is RNA or, or DNA, and when they do that, they turn on an activity, a, a capability that allows a big um, amplification of the signal. So in other words, for every molecule of virus RNA that gets detected, we can, uh, we can see uh, many, many molecules of a reporter a piece of, of nucleic acid, like a little piece of DNA, getting cut. And so there's a way to, to do that, use, use that activity such that there's a big release of, of, uh, of a chemical signal that can be seen visually. And so you, get, uh, you get a, the, have the ability to use this CRISPR system to literally detect and then report on its detection of a piece of uh, viral RNA very, very quickly. So in other words, you can engineer it so that if it cuts something that's the virus we're talking about, it glows. It sort of has a phosphorescent or some signal. Does that mean you could have home detection kits that could do it quickly and anybody could just look at it the way they could a pregnancy test and say, that's, okay, I've got it? That's the idea. Absolutely. I think that's a very interesting possibility of how this uh, system could ultimately be used. Are we talking uh, a week, a month, or a year? We're not talking a week. Uh, we may be talking months. Uh, we're certainly, I think we're, I think we're less than a year from that. It's hard to say. Now, we've been talking about detection, like how can you test and detect this. Let's talk about treatments for a second. Um, I know that at Stanford, one of your friends and colleagues, Stanley Key, has come up with something he called Pac-Man, 
which is a way for the actually uh, use a CRISPR-based system to actually attack the virus if somebody's sick. Tell us how that's progressing. Yeah, so this is a, another kind of clever idea about how to use CRISPR enzymes to fight the viral infection. And the idea there is to literally, uh, like, a, like for those of you that remember Pac-Man, like I do, uh, this is you know literally using enzymes that will go after and cut and destroy only the viral RNA and not uh, RNAs that are uh, present in normal cells. And so this is, a, I think, a clever approach. It's been tested in a laboratory setting, and uh, there's some you know, hope there that, the, the, that it looks like that technically it can work. I think the challenge is how do you get that into, uh, into, into a patient? How do you get it into, into infected cells? And so if you wanted to get it into infected cells, you'd have to have a delivery mechanism. What are the delivery mechanisms? Well, it's very difficult because uh, in, in, in the infection with this virus involves uh, infection in the lung. And so uh, we would need to have a way to deliver these CRISPR enzymes into lung cells. And that's something that's very hard right now. Um, fortunately, there's, a, there's an effort at the Innovative Genomics to do exactly that for a different purpose, namely for uh, treating cystic fibrosis, which is a lung disease that where we think eventually the CRISPR technology could have an impact. So the notion that these CRISPR enzymes could cut up and chop away and destroy the uh, COVID-19 virus uh, in somebody's lungs, let me ask the same question. Is that months away, years away? Uh, probably years, honestly. Um, you know, I think uh, we're, we're uh, trying to accelerate the pace of doing that sort of testing, but uh, as you may know, that sort of test would require going into uh, human patients and going through uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. So this is, you know, realistically, it's years. Another thing CRISPR could do in theory would be to edit our own genes and so that our cells don't have receptors that allow a particular virus to get in. Is that a possibility? Well, um, that's a possibility in the, in the long time future, I would say. It's certainly not something that will be, I think, effective in this particular pandemic. One of the challenges to doing, taking that approach is that one has to know, first of all, which receptor to, to, uh, to go after. And we do know that for, for the, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But uh, the, when, when we talk about a receptor for a virus, we're talking about a normal protein that's on the, pre on the, on the surface of a of human cell. And as you can imagine, that could be problematic to, to try to remove it. It's probably there for a reason. So, uh, so that's one thing. But then, uh, then there's also the issue, as we just talked about for the, the uh, Pac-Man approach, that one has to figure out delivery and how to target the CRISPR proteins to cells where they could create protective changes. And I think that's, again, something that's going to take years to develop. We say it will take years. Didn't we just have a world famous case a year and a half ago where a Chinese scientist, Ha Zhang Qi, actually did that for the HIV virus receptor of a cell, but he was able to edit the embryos of kids so they no longer had that receptor and couldn't catch HIV. So you say it's a long time away, but it's already been done for one receptor, right? Um, okay, well, there's a lot of ways to answer that question. <laughs> First of all, uh, you know, I think the, the ethics of, of that study uh, were, were um, uh, unfortunately uh, very flawed, and uh, that study has been pretty roundly condemned by the international community. Beyond that, I would say that uh, you know, doing any kind of um, embryo editing is, um, is just impractical for, for multiple reasons, both technical and, and, and kind of ethical. And, uh, and finally, one would need to know in advance which proteins to target. Um, in the case of HIV, we do know about the uh, receptor proteins for HIV infection, but for most viruses, or, or certainly for emerging uh, viruses in the future, we can't necessarily predict. When you put together a consortium that has various universities and philanthropies and foundations, did you, in this case, say, we're going to have a slightly different set of rules about to the extent to which we're going to try to uh, profit from or use this in a proprietary way and instead share it? 
Yeah, actually, that's been a topic of very active discussion because I think many scientists, myself included, we don't want to be, we have no desire to profit financially from this. We really want to be contributing our expertise and we're, we're not seeking to, to profit from it. We are working with uh, university officials to see if we can put out, put out publicly a statement about how intellectual property will be managed for this pandemic, how we can make uh, discoveries that are gonna come from this large team of people that are now working on the problem um, you know, openly available so that it can be developed very quickly. And I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to do that quite fast. So stay tuned. I, we're hoping to make a, an announcement about that in the near term. Dr. Jennifer Doudna, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me.